This is Money Talks. My name is Michael Campbell. Money Talks is brought to you by Solera Club. Solera Club is a royalty-based investment, which means you get paid first. Uh, it has no fees, and it's in the tech sector. For more information, go to soleraclub.com. I'm not starting today with happy news, but it's a reality that we have to face, and willful blindness doesn't change the facts. My thoughts are with the families and victims of the overwhelming tragedy in Nice. This is the seventh terror, a terror attack in France in the last 18 months. Some 240 dead, and we're counting. Sadly, our governments keep on treating terrorist attacks, even if they mention the word terrorist. Laughably, the CBC went so far as to say that the victims of Nice were killed by a truck, not an ISIL sympathizer. Of course, the establishment's always careful not to say the word ISIL or Al-Qaeda. But the worry is that they treat these things as one-off events, like this is it, instead of acknowledging they're part of a major trend. But as I say, my sympathies with the families and the victims. And speaking of major trends, I have to tell you why I keep going on about the establishment and the protection of the status quo power groups. You don't get that one. You're not going to get anything about what's happening uh, politically, socially, but especially economically. The reason straightforward, the declining confidence in the political establishment, and it might be out of China and their money moves into the Vancouver real estate market. Uh, it could be out of Ukraine. Their money moved into London. It doesn't matter where. But the declining confidence in the political establishment, and I'm including politicians, organized labor, crony capitalists, the media commentariat, that's going to be the main driver of capital around the world. And hence, currency prices, bonds, stocks, precious metals. You don't understand that one, you're going to be left behind and confused. I mean, your political sympathies don't make a whit of difference. Although some people I know take them very seriously. They cling to them like a psychological safety net. Well, fair enough. But bad news. They don't matter. See, I feel the need to talk and continue talking about this because I'm virtually alone in the mainstream media questioning the status quo in the political establishment. I mean, gosh, look at that federal election campaign. Not one question on anything that would challenge the system. No questions on how the government's going to handle the impact of an aging population on health care. No questions about unfunded liabilities for the public sector pensions. Why? Because the answers would expose the need for change. Now, given my goal here is to protect you financially from the inevitable changes coming from things like the entitlement crisis, the sovereign debt crisis in emerging markets in Europe, the European banking crisis right now, U.S. debt and unfunded liability problems that have already put Rhode Island, Detroit, Stockton, Atlantic City, Puerto Rico into bankruptcy. They're going to claim Chicago and Illinois soon. Well, I'm proud of the fact that I've been talking about the impact of the decline in confidence in government, the fallout from government's failure to adapt to the intense changes gripping the world on the economy and investments for years. On Money Talks, we warned about deflation. We warned about the dramatic price decline in oil, rest of the commodity sector. We told you to protect yourself by buying U.S. dollars when the loonie was still above par. We warned that in October 2007, there was a credit tsunami coming and said, get back into stocks, dividend, high quality, dividend paying stocks in March 2009. And by the way, I still continue to think that the interest rate scenario is one of flat to down. Why? Because there is no economic growth going on that would more warrant moving those rates higher. We said that a major bull market in stocks is going to be propelled by money coming out of Europe. Well in advance, presto, what have we seen this past couple of weeks? New highs in U.S. stocks being propelled by European money. But the ultimate move, by the way, is going to come when confidence in the U.S. government bonds erodes to the point that the bond markets no longer seem to be safe. Arguably, that again is the ultimate reflection in the decline in confidence in government. I know it's tough for members of the status quo to understand, maybe tough for you to understand. For them, everything is a surprise, right? The Brexit vote's a surprise. The rise of Donald Trump was a surprise. The Five Star Movement's victory in Rome was a surprise. Syriza in Greece, the Freedom Party in Austria, all of them questioning the political establishment, and all of it a surprise to our elites. One of the great cons of all time is the pretense that the political establishment acts in your best interest. Well, the persistent inefficiency, waste, two-tiered wage and benefit systems between the public and private sector, at times corruption, it all reminds us it's not in your best interest. Come on, think about it. The lack of spending rules in the Senate that allowed Mike Duffy to lie on his expenses 
without penalty. We've got billion-dollar handouts of politically connected businesses like Bombardier. The repeal of the First Nations Financial Transparency Act. The fact that organized labor pays absolutely no tax on multi-billion dollar investments or that the American auto sector has received tens of billions of tax dollars or the sweetheart deal on politicians' pensions. None of that is in your best interest. Of course, the political establishment tells you it is. And it's impressive how successful they are in convincing so many people that the world's going to come to an end if you change something like the healthcare system. That's semi-monopoly. Or the educational model. You name it. Status quo power groups play on our fears. They tell us the sky is going to fall if really any fundamental change takes place. But in the end, history makes clear. Education, health care, pensions, the scope of government, the nature of economic growth, it's all changing. The question for you is, are you going to be proactive about it? Or are you going to survive with that? Or are you going to be reactive and ultimately be financial roadkill? Money Talks is brought to you by Solera Club. And you can find more information on soleraclub.com. Stay with me. i got a big fat idea. I've got a great quote of the week. i got Paul Beatty coming your way. GT Global, looking forward to that. And Michael Levy on deck with a couple of real hot stories. All that on the Money Talks Network. Got a big fat idea coming up, but right now I got Michael Levy on the line with me. Hey, Mike, before we get into a, a couple other stories, I got to start with this one. I mean, I look at, uh, you know, you sit there dreaming of having the big idea. And one of the big differences, of course, in this environment, if you've uh, developed an app or a software program, obviously the multimillionaires and, or billionaires, sorry, in Facebook, Twitter, that kind of stuff. I mean, gosh, it would be, uh, you know, wouldn't that be nice? But I'm looking at this huge phenomenon. You've been following the Pokemon Go thing. Well, Mike, this is really interesting because and I'm, I'm just going to read you a bit of a description. Uh, uh, Blockbuster, Blockbuster new location-based application launches and breaks the Internet. So overwhelming is consumer demand for this service, its servers can barely keep up, which fuel only fuels the hype about the new app. And that app was back in 2005, and it was Google Maps when we could see our houses from space as we came down on the earth and pinpointed where we wanted to be. Now, what's happening now? That sounded like Pokemon Go, but Pokemon Go, uh, back in 205, um, it's millions of consumers. Back here in 216, it's hundreds of millions of consumers. And they didn't break the Internet, but they sure crowded it. Well, I'm looking at the stock. I mean, gosh, I wish I'd owned Nintendo. I saw in the Japanese markets, in yen terms, it was up 93%. You know, I saw it tacked on about $14.5 billion in uh, stock value in about five days after this launch. I mean, it, it's just incredible. And this guy, John Hankey, who developed Google Maps, is the same developer who has developed this new Pokemon Go, as you say, for Nintendo and uh, analysts are calling this the biggest mobile game in U.S. history. And uh, this uh, this fellow is no uh, stranger uh, for doing outstanding things. But you know, it's funny uh, when asked why, like, what's his raison d'être, Mike? What's the reason that he is so excited about this? And his reasoning is is that he's taking people outside. He's getting them away from their computer screen. He's getting them away from sitting in dark rooms, and he's making mm -hmm. them go outside in the fresh air to go and find Pokemon. You know, one of the things that blows me away, and, and seriously, you get to an age is, you know, I'm not a gamer, but I was amazed to see that over 41 billion, with a B, that's the download of sort of entertainment game kind of apps. 23% of all app downloads, which is a monster market, is for these kinds of things, uh, you know, in an entertainment style. I mean, I never played it, but I remember when Candy Crush came on or Angry Birds, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's mind-blowing how big this industry is. And, 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 Mike, I don't see any of the uh, generation after the millennials and but not into the baby boomers it is uh, definitively and when you watch on television and you see the coverage it is this younger generation that is so all consumed in these uh, apps that are coming these games um, to be able to do stuff online now obviously you and I and others do stuff online but mostly it can be research or you're reading or you're looking for interesting things but we are not so all consumed. So the fact that this is such a hit, such a success, speaks volumes to 
the desires to what this generation is looking for with, as you say, the hundreds of millions of downloads. 15 million downloads of uh, Pokemon Go in the first few days. And you know what's interesting, just very quickly, I, I want to get on to other things, but you know, the, one of the reasons Nintendo's uh, done well, it's only 30% owner of this, but they've got, it looks like it's a whole bunch of legacy stuff, the same way Disney keeps throwing out the same old movies, maybe a, a, a sequel, that kind of stuff. Well, Nintendo owns Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, and I think people are anticipating a heck of a lot more this style game being up just like they've done with Pokemon. Well, yes, Mike, and that, that's exactly what's going to happen. And as they do Pokemon, they are downloading the other ones. And the fact is they can see the market, so they will be upgrading, and it could be just a whole new tsunami of people on the Internet oh. downloading. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's head-shaking. Yeah, it really is. Hey, look, I want to get to another story here because it's, it's kind of fun the way they put it. But if you were lucky enough to own a home in Canada – you probably made more money in the last year uh, than a Canadian has on average, oh, well, you know, through their income, I meant, through the average Canadian's income. Well, the Bank of Montreal did a study, just a great study. A house in this country makes more money in a year than a Canadian on average. And, <laughs> well, they're talking about the, the average price of a Canadian house last year. It appreciated more than 11%. And that appreciation, average price we're talking about, 11% increase, made more money than the average Canadian worker. So, with home prices up 11.2% year over year, the average sale price last month, this is across the country, was $500,300, and that's up $50,610. That edges out the average annual pay of a Canadian, which is, with benefits in, 49565 So... The house yeah, I mean, you're in made more money than you did on average. It would be very interesting to see those same stats, but remove Vancouver, greater Vancouver, remove you know parts of Toronto out of it. Because I know this, if you're lucky enough to own a home, probably even a condo in many parts of uh, Vancouver, but certainly a, a single detached home, you made a lot more than 50 grand last year when you see the rise. And same with parts of Toronto. So it'd be very interesting if you just looked at those two markets. I wonder if the rest of Canada made out quite that well. But, I, mean, I don't still, think. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think so. Might be, but the biggest gain, and this might be a bit of a surprise, the biggest gain in Canada was the Fraser Valley. <laughs> and they made double that amount. They made 23% on their homes. So you're talking about the right areas. You're talking about Vancouver, greater Vancouver, and Toronto. But I love, as one listener of CKNW tweeted after we put this report out yesterday, we tweeted this report, and uh, he had a great tongue-in-cheek. He says, step one, buy a house. Step two, quit your job. Step three, <laughs> sit back and grow rich. Yeah, there you go. Well, as I say, the housing market's been top of mind, but I thought that was a cool way of uh, at least discussing it. Mike, thanks very much, and have a terrific weekend. You too, Mike. Thanks. Michael Levy here with me every week, talking about some of the hot stories that are going around. I'll take a break. I'll come back. We've got a big, fat investment idea for you. Stay with us. I hope you go to moneytalks.net. We have some terrific uh, articles there. Most popular this week was... Uh, Martin Armstrong talking about the legal community shock that uh, FBI Director Comey didn't indict Hillary Clinton. Well, he's putting, calling that all part of the collapse in government. Uh, all had a lot of people looking at the three megatrends dominating global real estate right now, and also a big article on gold, silver, and miners uh, in that. So always worthwhile going to moneytalks.net. Let's change now to the big fat idea. I've got Kyle Green, president of the Green Mortgage Team, joining me on the line right now. Kyle, thank you for joining me, and uh, let's start right into it. What's the big idea? The big idea that I have is uh, looking at refinancing and pulling out equity to invest, and that can be investing in real estate, stocks, mutual funds, whatever you want, but uh, borrowing at, uh, at all-time low interest rates to, uh, to invest seems like uh, it's a really popular idea right now. So, in other words, you've got some equity sitting in your home, and so you can borrow against that equity. And uh, let me just ask you very quickly, how much does that cost right now? What's the interest rates if you if you uh, take out a second mortgage, as it were? Yeah, 
So uh, to borrow money on a line of credit, it's prime plus 0.5, which is 3.2%. If you're borrowing it on a mortgage, then you're looking at 2.5% or lower. Uh, low uh, interest rate terms like two-year or variable are around 2.2, 2.3% right now. Okay, so uh, let's talk more about this. Give me, uh, well, you've, you've already alluded to one. You've got record low interest rates would be one of the reasons you'd look at this kind of a strategy. Anything else? Yeah, the uh, when you borrow funds to invest, the funds are actually tax deductible too. So you're actually creating a, uh, a tax deduction for yourself that you wouldn't otherwise have. So some of our clients will actually have cash that they want to invest. And if they still owe money in their mortgage, sometimes they'll actually... I will advise them to pay down their mortgage, re-borrow the funds, and now they've created a tax deduction they didn't have. So uh, the fact that you can uh, write off the interest is a really, uh, really interesting key right now, too. Okay, let's, uh, and again, let let me come back just a little bit. Uh, How difficult is it to set this up? You know, it's not that difficult. We've had a lot of clients who fully paid off their mortgage. Um, They've been paid off for years, and what they're finding is that their investment returns are dropping year over year and they can't really rely on that anymore. And so a lot of people now are, are dipping in and, and refinancing. It is becoming a little bit more difficult than it used to be, but for strong applicants, the money is still there and it's not that difficult to obtain a, at least a few hundred thousand dollars from your home equity. Who do you consider this appropriate for? I'm thinking in terms of risk. Yeah, I would say that this is a higher medium risk because you are borrowing funds. And so if the return on the investment is below the cost of the borrowed funds, you need to make up for that. Sure. Um, you know, so this only makes sense if you have investment options that are substantially better returns at a le- relatively low risk. So uh, personally, I, I'm a fan of, uh, of investing in private mortgages. Typically, you can invest in a fund that invest in second mortgages for uh, for individuals who can't get financing through banks, which is becoming more and more popular nowadays as banks are tightening up, and the returns are typically about 6 to 9%. So people are borrowing their money at around 3%, investing into these funds and getting a return of 6 to 9% and, and creating a spread on money that they've just mm-hmm. borrowed from one source and lent to another. So obviously, I mean, the whole key there is to make an assessment with your financial advisor. Is this going to, what's the probability of this uh, investment continuing to yield higher than the cost of the money you're taking in uh, or you're paying out rather, excuse me, the money on the loan, the interest on the loan, it's got to be less than the money you're uh, getting from the interest on the, uh, sorry, on the investment you've chosen. How, just quickly, how long do you think you'd have to hold something like this or what should you plan? I mean, it's not like you're going to do it one week to the next. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. So it really depends. And the beauty of this type of product is you can convert and lock in portions of this line of credit into mortgages. So if you invest into a, uh, into a fund that has a five-year uh, time horizon to, uh, to get paid out on, you can lock in your funds into a five-year fixed at around 2.5%. Mm-hmm. So it really depends on what you're investing in. If it's a short-term turnover, then you may want to keep the money on a line of credit and pay interest-only payments on it so you can pay it off in full when, you're, uh, when, when, the, uh, when the fund pays out. But you can also lock into one to 10-year terms to have the mortgage money line up with what the expected payout of the um, of the investment is. Good stuff, Kyle. It's another example of how record low interest rates impact on a lot of areas. Uh, Kyle Green is president of the Green Mortgage Team. You can find him at www.greenmortgageteam.ca. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks a lot. Okay, we're going to take a break. I'll come back. There's so much more to talk about. I hope you're, by the way, as I said earlier, following Money Talks on uh, moneytalks.net. There's so much to talk about in that regard. Also, again, I hope you sign up for us and join us on Michael Campbell's Money Talks on Facebook or Money Talks Tweet, Michael Campbell's Money Talks on Facebook. You can also find it on YouTube, by the way, and go to moneytalks.net. I'll take a break. I'm coming back. One of my favorite guys. You're going to have Paul Beatty with me, president of GT Global. We've also got a great shocking stat. We've got Aussie Jurek, so many important stuff to go over. We'll do that right here on Money Talks. Stay with us.